The U.S. Air Force is convinced collaborative combat aircraft are the technology of the future. But if they're going to make these drones pop off paper and into reality, there's some technologies they still need to develop. Breaking into vents gather a group of experts to talk through these technologies, and we start with the power plants that should make the CCA fly. Where's the engine situation sitting, Michael? Yeah, um, so at least when it comes to the, the two existing prototypes that we know about, uh, the Fury and the Gambit, uh, those companies have been pretty mum about what engines they're actually using, but we do have some hints that we can read into. Uh, the Air Force previously released an RFI asking for engines in the 3,000 to 8,000 pound thrust range. You know, that was just an RFI. They probably learned a lot from industry's responses mm -hmm. to that, but that gives you an idea of what the Air Force is thinking about. That. I, uh, I was there for a signing between GE and Kratos to develop a new family of engines. Uh, but they, uh, they specifically said that those engines would be, would maybe kind of top out around the 3,000 pound thrust mm. range. They're targeting um, Lorner munitions, um, you know, probably cheaper drones uh, with, uh, whose engines have lower cycle times. Essentially the expectation being that these things aren't going to last. Definitely not as long as a fighter jet. Yeah. Um, and there are other companies, you know, I also spoke with Honeywell at Farnborough, and they're targeting kind of the the mid to higher portion of the market mm. with, with an existing engine of theirs. Uh, there are other partnerships announced uh, recently, you know, over in Europe, there's Rolls-Royce and ITP Aero. Uh, and Pratt & Whitney, uh, too, um, is, is talking about taking existing engines and incorporating 3D printing technology to to make them a lot cheaper, produce them faster and at scale. So I, I, this has been a really interesting um, case for, for industry to attack it from a lot of different angles. You have a lot of different pitches and strategies for how to meet this kind of budding market. I think weapons is an, uh, an area where more time needs to be spent because mm. right now we are stuck sort of building an airframe that can accommodate an AMRAM or an Argam ER, which means it needs to be pretty big. Yeah. And as you move forward, and in particular, as the US invests more in weapons technology and new propulsion, maybe we can develop smaller systems that can fit in a smaller CCA, which allows us to drive the cost down there. So um, I think weapons specifically de designed instead of repurposed um, from crewed aircraft yeah. would be a, an area where there's a lot of potential. I do think that the Air Force, however, is um, counting on cost savings from sustainment, right? It's the fact that you're not going to fly these, most of them. They're going to be, as General Wills Box said, in, in a hangar ready to go. Right. And that that operations and maintenance budget is what's going to go down. But that that's a pretty big paradigm shift for defense industry today, which makes a lot of its profit uh, on, sustainment. on sustainment. So. This is uh, path-breaking in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, Michael, talk about sustainment, because I know this is something you've been poking at. Yes, anyone who reads Breaking Defense knows I love to talk about sustainment, because that's where the money is. Uh, and um, where actually a lot of the biggest disputes are between industry and the government, not just about the sustainment model, but the actual data that you need to be able to service uh, a, a certain weapon system uh, out in the field or in, or in, or in the depot. Um, and you know, to Stacy's point, it's not just that uh, CCA aren't going to have a long sustainment tail. Uh, I was in a roundtable with General Alvin recently, where he specifically talked about you know that being the plan. It's also that CCA have a government reference architecture, where the Air Force, with uh, kind of a uh, a newer approach to acquisitions. I mean, I think that just kind of underscores how important production is going to be. Um, you know, that really needs to be the place where industry can make money. Um, that and the development of these, of, of these aircraft. But historically, you know, early production runs, you know, there's a lot of risk. It's difficult to set up, you know, new production lines. Uh, so that's a big question for a company like Andril. Um, I think, it, that'll be an interesting thing to follow. I mean, even with well-established aircraft producers like Boeing or Lockheed Martin, you see a lot of production instability right now. All of that can be affected by inflation, by supply chain, 
all things that are terrible right now. So uh, it, it, it kind of, it kind of, you know, uh, is a big challenge, and it's also something that is going to factor into pricing unit costs for for all of these because industry is going to want to be sure that it gets its money. Mm -hmm. And we saw Northrop Grumman actually say at one point that they were not going to keep going on this CCA. Part of their issue is they said it wasn't expensive enough in some ways. Right? Yeah, Northrop specifically what Northrop Grumman said is that. Uh, they are not targeting attributable drones. They are going for the more high performance uh, type of aircraft that, you know, and this is part of kind of the debate over that industry is having right now is, you know, how attributable can these aircraft be? Yeah. How high performance do they have to be to be able to achieve their mission? So, um, you know, a lot of different takes out there. Uh, and, you know, the, the Air Force is, you know, for now confident in their plan. Um, but there's certainly a, def a, a, a series of different theories of success. The jamming is an interesting point, too, because obviously these things need to have secure links to a fast jet. Potentially that is dogfighting with another thing that's in stealth mode, that's operating in, in contested, dangerous environments. Uh, and it seems to me that the first thing I would do if I was an enemy that saw these things coming in was trying to sever the links and you know get the CCAs ripped off from the planes. How is the Air Force is going to try to deal with that? I, I mean, I think that's a big question. I, you know, you look at if you're going to have an, a CCA partner with an F-35. Mm -hmm. F-35 has two data links. It has F, or, uh, Link 16, which is the NATO standard that everyone has. I think, and Stacy, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's it, the wide perception of Link 16 is that it's jammable, right? Like by our by our near peers we we can't just assume that that would not be jammed um you know f-35 also has a stealth data link uh Madel, but now it's sort of like okay so is every cca going to need to have link 16 and Madel? and then you know if they're going to partner with an f f-22 then the f-22 has its own stealth data link well what about ngad then that needs its own, you know, data link. And then, you know, so you, you get into this, you get into this sort of question of like, okay, this is a lot of payload to be adding, a lot of weight, power. So it is a big question, again, one that the Air Force has not tackled publicly at all.